Okay, um, I'm sure more people will be joining us as we go, but um, let's get going. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Liam Duffy. I'm a strategic advisor of the Counter Extremism Project, which is a non-profit, non-partisan international policy organization uh, based in New York, founded in New York in 2014, but with offices in Brussels, Berlin, and London. Um, and I'm part of the London team. Some of you, some of you may know me looking down the list. Um, delighted to say I'm joined today by uh, Professor Jutta Clausen of uh, Brandis University. She is the author of uh, a number of books, including the cartoons that shook the world um, about the Yillens Poston affair, which um, is obviously very prescient given um, the recent attempt on Salman Rushdie's life and the ongoing disputes over, over blasphemy, um, blasphemy allegations. And she's also recently the author of a book, a phenomenal book last year called The West. Uh, Western Jihadism, uh, a 30 year history, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, which was based on a multi-year unprecedented unparalleled database of Western Jihadists, um, which Jutta Clausen is the curator of at Brandeis University. So um, I've given you a very brief introduction there, uh, Ms. Clausen, but hopefully you can fill in any blanks, um, anything that I've missed that you'd like people to know and just give us a bit of background on uh, the Western Jihadism project. And before you do that, sorry, I forgot to say, um, I'll leave some time at the end for questions and comments. Um, so use the Q&A function and the chat function, um, and I'll do my best to get to as many as I can from the audience. But um, needless to say, I won't be able to, be able to get to every all of them. So um, thank you, Professor Clausen. And yeah, tell us anything that I, I missed about you or the project. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction. I don't think you skipped the beat. So uh, um, I also thank you to uh, the audience for logging in uh, to hear about um, my book and my work on, on um, Westerners uh, who have joined uh, what I call the Global Jihadist Movement. Uh, I started the project uh, 16 years ago because I was uh, frustrated by um, the lack of comparative uh, data. Um, every country researchers would go, uh, governments would report, uh, commission reports, uh, but they, everybody would just look in their own backyard. And um, professionally speaking, uh, my field is comparative politics. Uh, so I um, know that that approach, that uh, sort of looking in my own backyard approach, uh, uh, will lead people to generalize from uh, their own experiences and produce what I call na uh, national narratives. And we are dealing uh, with a global project. And so my question was, um, what role did the Westerners actually uh, play in um, the uh, development of bin Laden's movement? Uh, so I uh, go back to the 1990s and um, uh, developed um, a methodology for how to, um, based on historical sociology, really, um, I developed a methodology for uh, uh, recording, uh, coding, uh, very detailed pieces of information about um, people who had uh, carried out a terrorism incidents or been convicted um, in relationship to such incidents. Um, in, uh, in Europe and North America. So why did I make that uh, distinction between why did I not include uh, a, a broader set of countries? Uh, well, I, I was principally interested in pursuing the question about, um, so why do they do it and how do they do it? Uh, you know, this is a debate that we have had for a long time. Uh, the, the seeming contradiction that people who uh, grow up in a uh, democratic society with free speech and um, uh, the ability to articulate uh, grievances in a legitimate way, then um, uh, reach for violence, and uh, in this case, reach for violence in the name of um, a version of Islam that uh, no Muslims really uh, support. Uh, so um, my, my work, um, because of the uh, data uh, that I collected, uh, in, covers both uh, demographic information about the individuals, who were they, were they converts? At which point in time did converts start to join the movement? Were they immigrant origin? Were they what we call native born? Uh, and what were their relations uh, to each other and to the various conspiracies uh, that uh, over the past 30 years have come to define the movement? So as part of the work, 
because I eventually got so much data that I couldn't stick to the spreadsheets that I had originally set up. And I put it into um, um, uh, SQL, um, relational database management tool. I had an online portal uh, and uh, now actually use the online portal for my own work, but I'm also giving access to other researchers who are interested in getting and using the data. And there are some publications coming out written uh, by other people testing some of the various hypotheses that really have been with us for a long time, such as um, is, 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 are most of the people actually uh, educated in this in the sciences or so engineers uh, um, and certainly the first generation uh, often were uh, engineers as, as Stefan Martak has written about this uh, but also the uh, really long-running question about the role of um, discrimination and um, hostile uh, policies towards Muslims and Muslim integration in driving anger uh, so I won't, uh, my book uh, answers many of these questions, uh, but also because of the way that I have collected this data over the years, I'm able in the book uh, to chart uh, the cycles, uh, the different cycles of change and uh, activity uh, that we have seen. Um, and I hardly need to remind um, anybody here that um, when um, Bin Laden started in the 1990s, uh, out of Sudan uh, to develop his movement, um, he didn't recruit uh, as much as he was part of what Daniel Byman, he used what Daniel Byman has called a mergers and acquisition strategy. He put, uh, he started out using his money, which he still had uh, at that time uh, from Sudan uh, to uh, provide financial support uh, for um, groups that then became incorporated under his organizational umbrella. I think that uh, some of the things I have to write about the 1990s will be a surprise uh, to many people who are interested in the more historical aspects. Uh, I have a chapter, for example, about um, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Uh, uh, and uh, based on my data uh, and uh, my analysis of the networks behind that, I tie that uh, incident far more into the core Al Qaeda organization and his relationship his, his, his uh, real uh, important character uh, coming from the Egyptian uh, exiled uh, extremists who really were the first generation of uh, Al-Qaeda men. Uh, so um, uh, I think if you then go and move on to Europe, um, there might be some surprises about how well integrated uh, the uh, uh, various uh, uh, incidents that we know from the uh, 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 what became known as the metro bombings in, 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 in France it wasn't just the Par Parisian metro that was bombed, there was also other um, efforts to bomb uh, infrastructure at that time. Uh, and how well integrated uh, that actually, uh, that whole uh, scene was within the core Al Qaeda organization. Uh, which then uh, leads to a much broader question that I try to address in the book uh, about the um, strategic leadership and the role of the Westerners in, uh, in the building of the global movement. And I reached a perhaps somewhat controversial um, conclusion that Bin Laden couldn't have built his movement without uh, the ability to place his um, um, cadre, his uh, leadership cohort, in uh, United States and in, um, in places like Paris and uh, London and uh, many other places, including some very small cities often. Uh, so it was that, that generation of uh, exiles uh, who benefited from the uh, increasingly more liberal immigration policies and policies for refugee ships uh, that um, the West um, in many countries embraced in those years. And um, now they then, uh, the, this cohort of immigrants who had already rad radicalized before they came to the West became really the, the, uh, the status of um, what then uh, became um, a much broader movement. Um, the uh, numbers when we look at it is really amazing. Um, it is perhaps worth asking if counterterrorism policies have uh, ultimately failed um, because we are looking uh, 
Today, um, uh, perhaps as many as 100,000 people, some estimates uh, go even up to 250,000 uh, people who belong to one of the many groups that are brought under the umbrella of, uh, of, of the jih uh, jihadist movement globally. We don't have any real good sense of how many there are left in, uh, in Western Europe and in in the United States. Uh, I do caution that um, we have historically had um, uh, a tendency uh, to underestimate uh, the movement's ability to regenerate uh, and embrace uh, new uh, tactics and uh, new strategies. Uh, so in the book, I argue also that um, uh, the what we came to call homegrown terrorism, which became exemplified by the July uh, uh, the July 7 bombers in 2005 and um, the follow-up uh, failed uh, effort by um, another uh, group that also had been trained uh, in by, by um, bin Laden's uh, officers um, on July 21st, uh, that this whole phenomenon was part of the strategic adjustment uh, that uh, Al-Qaeda made after 9-11. Uh, and uh, we have, I mean, we have the evidence that Bin Laden very deliberately went about starting to recruit people with uh, uh, Western passports, American passports. Uh, Jose Padilla is an example who was sent to, um, to the US uh, on the heels of the 9-11 attacks to, 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 to blow up uh, gas stations or gas pipes. Uh, now, then in this broader context, then what became known as do-it-yourself terrorism really pushed out by um, Anwar al-Awlaki and al-Qaeda in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, really deputized uh, by bin Laden to, to, to do this outreach, became an example of another type of uh, uh, strategic adjustment. When you think about the Islamic State and its shift uh, to direct frontline um, recruitment without any filtering mechanisms uh, for, um, you know, quality or uh, capability of, of the new recruits. Uh, that reflected this uh, strategic uh, uh, opening that um, the Islamic State's occupation of territory um, in, uh, in, in uh, Syria and Iraq opened. They were interested in settling the territory. They wanted Westerners to come and displace the local population. and. Uh, so this was a settlement project. And then the minute you move back into an underground guerrilla organization, well, nobody's interested in bringing 14 year old women into the, um, uh, in, in, into the, the uh, in recruiting them because there's no place anymore uh, for them to settle down and become uh, rewards to um, a new generation of fighters. So uh, in this uh, broader perspective, I think we are in a situation today. So you know, you're probably gonna ask, okay, that's all fair and well, but what then is the next phase? Uh, and, uh, you know, it's always uh, hard uh, to, uh, and difficult to predict, but I think we have examples of, of what the next phase will be in, in Africa and uh, perhaps uh, beyond. Uh, it is a, um, a far more decentralized uh, organizational picture, still tied together by um, a cadre of experienced, um, operatives who know each other and were, uh, learned their trade in the Syrian civil war. And this new generation uh, and their networks really stretch all the way from, uh, from Afghanistan uh, to, to Northern Mozambique and, uh, and Mali. But uh, it would be naive to think that that network doesn't also include operatives in, um, in Europe. Uh, the, um, this next phase, uh, uh, I think uh, we can already see, ha has a different um, um, strategic objective, uh, and that is to establish uh, many more sort of localized emirates in, co in contrast and contrary to bin Laden's uh, admonitions that um, the, um, the movement should never set up states, uh, should never take responsibility for uh, providing infrastructure and electricity and 
um, all these types of things that come with uh, controlling a plot of land uh, to the local population. Uh, I think uh, I'm an Al Savahiri actually started out uh, with a, a, a shift in, in strategy. And now we see this far more decentralized picture of groups that are still connected through networks, but appear completely independent and have some strategic um, difference, uh, have uh, options for, for taking up temporary um, alliances. Uh, and um, I think uh, uh, Rafaela Pantucci recently had an article arguing that here in the next phase, we are looking at a situation where regional powers and um, localized uh, uh, totalitarian, authoritarian um, regimes will make temporary alliances with the jihadists and the jihadists will become fighters in those types of localized wars. Um, and I think that we have seen that Africa is now uh, the picture of that. Now, uh, those types of insurgencies cannot take place uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so uh, I, I think at this point in time, uh, we will continue to see sort of more self-starter operations in Europe. Uh, but at some point in time, uh, I think we should be aware that um, the basic objectives uh, of the movement have not changed. And it really is still um, what Sheikh Kapel called a war for the Muslim mind. It really is a question of using terrorist tactics to compel Muslims uh, to distrust uh, liberal democracy and uh, representation. And uh, that goal has not changed. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I've got, um, I've got a million questions based on what you've just said there, but I think um, let's, let's go back to the beginning a little bit. So um, obviously I mentioned the title of the book that is based on the project, it's the 30 year history um, of, of Jihad. So, I mean, we're speaking now a few days before the 9-11 anniversary. I think that's like one of the one of the most important points that I think we've got a short kind of institutional memory on these kind of things. And every time you, you spoke about phases and stages, every time there's a new phase or a new stage, we kind of have to relearn and, and remember everything that we learned or or didn't in the in the last phase or the last stage. So, you know, Jihad, the West's experiences with jihadism didn't begin with the ISIS recruitment wave. They didn't begin with uh, the 2005 bombings. They didn't begin with Madrid um, and they didn't be begin with 9-11. So can you, where where were the seeds of jihadism in the West planted? I think you touched on it with bin Laden's um, merger strategy, but who who were they? Who were those those pioneers of jihadism and, and how did they kind of grow those seeds into what we see today? So the... The pioneers uh, were the Egyptian groups, uh, and the Egyptians were far more successful in settling in the United States. Uh, they were also uh, where you have people like uh, Omar Abdul Rahman uh, setting up in Brooklyn, uh, taking over the um, Abdullah Assam's old fundraising network, uh, which, of course, uh, if you think about it, uh, was a totally legal operation. Uh, they're raising money to fight a war in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union, against the communists. And we, at that time, you know, we had Congress um, authorizing payments to train uh, the Muhyiddin in, in, in Pakistan. Um, so there was no, there was no, uh, there was no infrastructure uh, in the United States or for that matter, anywhere else uh, to really uh, understand uh, what, uh, um, the people who were associated with the Islamic, um, Egyptian Islamic Jihad or Al Ghama were really saying, uh, we, as, a, as a collective, we didn't have um, uh, an understanding of the various uh, different uh, branches of Islam. People barely knew the difference between Shia and Sunni at that time. And, and many people were uh, really convinced that actually, uh, even though we didn't like what they were talking about, um, these uh, preachers were, you know, Muslims who had been mistreated by regimes in the Middle East that we really shouldn't have any uh, thing to do with in any case. So uh, there was uh, uh, a real lack of understanding uh, in in Europe, um, and I have some data that shows that uh, some sixty percent of all of the uh, people involved in uh, the terrorist campaigns in, in Western Europe before 9-11 actually were Algerians. 
they were displaced Algerians. Uh, they weren't people who had been radicalized in, in while living in Paris or living actually, some of them lived, you know, in many of them lived in London actually. Uh, but they also, they settled in Copenhagen, they settled in Brussels, they settled in a lot of different places. And they kept talking to each other, but this was back in the day when they were connected together by a courier network that were carrying literally um, leaflets uh, from one location to another. So they were, they knew each other personally up front. This was not yet the age of, um, of the internet. Uh, that came later, uh, but Bin Laden was already at that time an early adapter. Uh, when he was kicked out of Sudan and lost uh, the ability to travel and ended up in uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, one of the first things he did was to buy uh, one of these bulky, expensive satellite phones that we had back in that day. That satellite phone was purchased using his Barclay bank account by an operative in California who had been associated with uh, the Abdullah Assam network. And then it was um, literally, it traveled to Afghanistan in, 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 uh, um, in a bag uh, with a courier. And who did he call most of the time? Well, he called London. So, you know, in, um, in the front page of the book um, is, is this global map, um, where it's really, um, it, it, I urge you to look at it very carefully because it looks like a sort of a digitalized picture of an imagined map. But this, all of these lines represent a communicative act between uh, the 6,000 plus people that I have in the database. And um, as you can see, um, there are some higher points here and there. Uh, again, the inclusion criteria here is that people have to be residents of the West. Uh, and you can see how deeply the, the, the Westerners were really integrated with the global movement. So this is 40,000 networks, communicative ads, um, elements in a network and that are mapped on top of each other to create this image. And I think it's perhaps the most, um, it's a very stark depiction of how well organized and how highly integrated um, this is. So I would challenge a challenge in the book, uh, words like homegrown terrorism. There really isn't any such thing as homegrown terrorism. This is, none of this was ever homegrown. It was always a globalized movement and the um, globalization uh, what provided the infrastructure and the technology uh, for Bin Laden to grow his movement. And after Bin Laden's uh, demise really put the new uh, generation uh, of, of leaders to take it to the next step. Yes, what we're dealing with today is a far more decentralized movement, but it still also has the ideology as a very important coordinating element. And this is an ideology that is inc that includes an action program, uh, which actually um, it, I think is something uh, we sometimes underestimate the importance of. I'm going to come back to your your networks point because I think it's obviously crucial and a linchpin of the book itself and I think there's a am I right in remembering there's there's a subtitle for a chapter in the book which just says networks 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 as though you know you just really need to drive that point home so we'll, we'll come back to that but I think you talked about the the pioneers of jihadism in the west being often um maybe exiles from other conflicts like Algeria or you know Islamist ex from regimes in the Middle East um so when when did we start seeing European born recruits to this movement. Uh, when did that become, when did that shift start to take place? And so because um, one of the sort of methodological trigger points is to, if you want to attract uh, change in a network, you need to figure out how to pinpoint people with a starting point. Mm. So you, you can't just code people with the day they are arrested. Arrest dates are maybe 10 years after they get first involved. Arrest dates have to do when people get caught. It doesn't have to do when, when they get started and become a node in the network. So um, I had my coders uh, comb through all of the uh, records to identify the moment when somebody was first publicly known, even if we only knew that maybe 20 years later, to get involved uh, with the movement. And uh, by, do this, by doing this, um, I, it's it was clearly the case that traveling to Afghanistan became really it became a really important recruitment uh, draw. Um, and uh, the Westerners, uh, the young men who, for instance, who became 
um, involved with a, a broader network, London-based network. Uh, they, they all went uh, to uh, Afghanistan and after 9-11 to Pakistan, to the, the Northwest Territories, uh, where they um, were really trained in, the, in what to do. Um, now, you see in the book, I have a graph uh, that depicts when people get started and you see uh, the, a real uptick well before 9-11 in recruitment. So several things follow from that. One is that uh, cycles of recruitment and mobilization, well, th th you can estimate the time lag. Uh, and essentially, uh, we don't realize what's going on until five years or there about after the seeds have already been put down for those actions. So that's why right now, uh, the seeds for the next wave are already uh, planted and uh, we don't really know what they are uh, when it comes to the West. Uh, we don't know uh, what this will look like. Will this be, uh, once travel is opening up, is people who have been infiltrated into the West using uh, false identities? We don't know. We do know a couple of things. We know that uh, there aren't nearly as much threat um, in, in the United States as there is in Western Europe, uh, which creates some really strategic uh, policy dilemmas uh, for, how to um, get uh, a movement behind, or get any movement, or, uh, not as in movement, but getting pushing forward uh, counterterrorism uh, efforts uh, because countries are just facing very different threat levels right now. And the United States is not terribly interested in the jihadists right now. We, we saw that actually after, sorry to interrupt, after the attacks in, there was Samuel Patti's beheading, then the Nice uh, Cathedral attack, and then the Vienna attack shortly afterwards. There would just seem almost a com like inability to understand from across the Atlantic, if I can put it bluntly, what the threat Europe was facing. And I, under I understand in the wake of uh, things like January the sixth and other things that have happened in in you know in the United States, the domestic threat there is very different. But uh, it was just yeah, it just seemed that the two were at complete loggerheads over those incidents between Europe, uh, European leaders, and North American leaders. Yeah, sorry, continue, I'll cut, I'll cut you off. That's okay. Um, maybe we should just uh, continue the, the discussion about counterterrorism. but um, uh, the, I think that the, 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 my recommendation is that um, we take history very seriously. I know that within uh, policymaking circles, there is some disdain uh, for history in the sense that History can't predict the next attack. Um, and I would, I would challenge that because history cannot, it's true, history cannot predict the next, next attack. Nobody can. If you go back to the 1990s, one reason that everybody was uh, just sort of turning uh, the, the away from dealing with the problem in Europe was that most of these attacks uh, actually were, were failures, uh, the Paris, uh, uh, the metro, so called metro bombings aside. Uh, and this is another risk uh, that I talk about in the book, that we pay attention only to the successful attack. It's like every time something happens, then suddenly people pay attention, with the exception of what you just mentioned, Liam, uh, when there's just different reactions in, uh, between Europe and, and, and the United States. Uh, but failed attacks, are, you know, they, they are part of a pattern and it is that pattern that we need to understand. So history is important in order to uh, get an understanding of the structures that the underlying structures that sustain um, these types of uh, capabilities. And we do have to admit that uh, the jihadist movement have uh, survived and grown well beyond anybody's expectations. So we can't sit around and still say, okay, we don't hear from them right now. They're not really a strategic threat to the homeland, so we don't need to pay attention. The problem with that argument is that you don't know when they're coming up next. And uh, if you let down your guards, uh, then the opening is created. But the bigger problem is that uh, the um, broader aspects of uh, how the jihadists um, play into a, a growing, um, problem with uh, localized destabilization and uh, um, unstable regimes and uh, ungovernable territories. Well, they are part of that picture. 
very much. I mean, Mali obviously is an example of that, but they're also part of the competition uh, between uh, countries for, I mean, Turkey and Egypt about um, what happens in Libya, um, you know, the United States, Russia, um, the Assad regime and Northern uh, Syria, um, all of these um, more uh, broader issues um, are very much uh, in play as well. Uh, I've thought of this this case study that you give in the book and it's it, the, a fairly well-known jihadist network in Europe, I think, but I, I think it's really portrays a lot of what you're talking about, particularly, I thought of it first when you said that maybe we need to consider that some of our counterterrorism policies have failed, but just then when you said that we only pay attention to the, the successful attacks, you know, it's not the that trend of not paying attention when there aren't waves of attacks is, um, I'm thinking of the case of uh, Olivia Correll um, being one of the exiles who came to the south of France and then the Klein brothers came under, Fabian Klein and his brother came under his wing and and they were involved in the around in the earlier in the, the first Iraq war 2003 2005 in funneling fighters and cash to the insurgency there but it was between 2005 and 2014-15 that the Klein brothers were growing their network from three or four people to three or four hundred people in Toulouse so it's like uh, in Toulouse and the surrounding area and you give that case in your book and I know it's a fairly well-known case of European jihadism but it just strikes me as a classic example of you know not really paying attention because we weren't dealing with attacks during that you know there were some but not as many attacks during that 10-year period but obviously the fruits of those labors were in that ISIS recruitment wave that we saw from the city so it kind of encapsulates a lot of the things that you try and get across in your book I think that case. Yeah I think one of the biggest policy failures early on was not paying attention to uh, the people leaving to fight in um, in the Syrian civil war and joining with, up with Jabhat al-Nusra initially. And um, the sentiment was, well, they're gone. So they're not our problem anymore. Why don't we just let them go down, down there and, and get themselves killed? But the problem is uh, they returned. Uh, you know, we, we now have, um, you know, probably uncertain estimates uh, about uh, how many returned before the borders to Turkey really closed. And, um, uh, those numbers are high. I mean, some estimates are that as much as 40% of the people who at one point in time uh, left to go and join Jabhat al-Nusra, later the uh, Islamic State's uh, fighter groups, or many of the other brigades that, you know, were uh, sort of locally organized based on, uh, on language and uh, ethnicity and um, that they came back. So, so if, I, we don't really have a way of researching those people uh, because they haven't come into, they're not being convicted. We don't have open source material about them. Uh, so that's that's one risk factor for sure. And I know there are many people who, many countries that are uh, governments have pointed out that there's a problem there, but we haven't gone forward to figuring out really uh, what to do. The other example, I think you, Oliver Correll, I can't remember what his original name was, but for those of you who don't know, he was actually, he, he was a Syrian uh, and changed his name and he started out uh, running um, uh, a restaurant. Um, so he was um, actually apparently quite successful as a, uh, with his restaurant. Uh, and then he, con he changed himself into becoming a, um, um, a, a recruiter and a so-called imam, which he didn't have any training for, but he became the real core of a, a collective of the people who, uh, you know, reached into prisons. And uh, I argue in the book that uh, uh, the war in Iraq uh, was a revived French jihadism. So we need to take these broad considerations into the picture. And one issue that ha Interpol has brought up uh, a couple of times has been uh, the localized convergence between uh, street gangs, drug dealing gangs, and, uh, uh, and, and, and jihadist, jihadist gangs. So uh, this localized picture of an increasingly sort of a gang-like structure um, is, is something um, that makes sense. Uh, at this point in time, 
uh, online recruitment is probably not where the movement is at. That is probably not really important because uh, clandestine operations where trust and uh, local knowledge and direct personal networks uh, will be the more important resources for mobilization. So let, let's let's come to that. Let's come to networks having touched on the Klein brothers and Corel. So there's some really striking lines in the book. I think there's one the what there's one that really stood out to me was um, uh, sorry if I butcher this, but it was uh, the growth of jihadist terrorism in the West can be explained by a simple axiom: uh, to become a terrorist, you have to know one. I think you said at one point in the book. So it's just really emphasizing those real personal, real life connections close to people's homes rather than, you know, I think I think you devote some time to this in the book as well. But a lot of our a lot of political will and a lot of what might be called countering violent extremism, CV efforts seem focused at like online radicalization. So if you could just expand on that and your the databases findings on that and the importance of those networks and real world relations. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it comes up in a number of different ways. Uh, that, so, for instance, uh, one chapter in the book is about um, Andam Chowdhury's. Uh, Andam Chowdhury took over uh, what was known as the Al Muhadirun network, um, and uh, from Omar Bakr Mohammed, who was exiled. Um, he actually went away on himself. He wasn't kicked out of the UK, but then he wasn't allowed back in. Uh, but the, uh, a key moment, uh, this was a well-known situation uh, in London, a part of what we called uh, at the time Londoniston. Uh, there were two key people um, in, who, who came to be the picture of uh, what became known as Londoniston, and then one was Omar Barkley Mohammed, uh, and uh, the other one was Abu Hamza uh, al Masri in the Finchbury Park Mosque. Now those two networks uh, were often, the two men were often seen as competitors. And uh, that was something that they were keen uh, to stress uh, that they were different, but they weren't. Uh, so if you go and look at uh, the people who grew out of, um, of those uh, circles in London and actually became terrorists and, and went abroad and or came back, uh, they went to both of the preachers. They went back and forth. Uh, this was a tightly integrated network between the two of them. And uh, in two, about 2010, um, uh, the UK went through a prescribing al Muhadirun and its various many incarnations and made life more difficult for Andam Chowdhury to recruit, but uh, similar bans did not happen elsewhere in Europe. So uh, uh, Andam Chowdhury went traveling. He went uh, to Oslo, he went to Copenhagen, he went to Amsterdam. Uh, he went to, to, to he went to and, and pulled all of these groups together into really became an integrated coherent uh, organization uh, with local emirs. He would proud it, and when when he, there was he was again he soaked up TV time. Uh, he was uh, and his groups uh, would embrace various sort of localized issues. They would stand in front of a polling booth on the election day and say Muslims are not allowed to vote. It's it's forbidden. Uh, all of these sort of things. And it was not so much that the message, uh, well, they, they did shame Muslims, which was uh, one of their main things. They also had Sharia street patrols to shame women who uh, and, and harass people. But the main point was to get propaganda, to get, uh, get it out, to get into TV news. And they succeeded very, very, very well. Uh, so in my book, I estimate that as, as many as maybe 40% of the, um, uh, travelers to the Islamic State actually came out of these types of groups, which were all locally managed. They had a very strong presence online, but uh, at the core of them, they were they were street side groups, uh, and um, they did not meet in mosques. They, I mean, that was something this movement did in the 1990s, but. Um, they did not do that uh, by, by 2010 and onwards. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, the, the online presence and the communication, you know, so they could use that uh, to make it possible to imagine what would life be on the other side in the Islamic state, in the promised land. And they had, uh, you know, small, they had heroes um, who, and role models who modeled what life would be and it became um, 
even more than a propaganda instrument, it became a means of communication for sustaining the real life network. So the online network was actually picking back on the real life network. And the fame <clears throat> that some of these influencers had really derived from uh, their, their, their local position. I think that, yeah, that's worth, um, that's worth stressing again. I think what you said about the over 40, some 40% 40 of the travelers came from the Sharia for networks like the ALM networks or the Sharia for Holland, Sharia for Belgium. I think, I think you said at one point it was even higher in the Sharia for Holland network. Most of the Dutch travelers were, came through that network and were activists for a long time. And I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of Siddhartha Dar, the bouncy castle salesman in, from London, who was, I think he was like interviewed on Vice News because he was doing those Sharia patrols that you mentioned. And I think, I think that the idea at the time was, you know, this was like a big novelty, wasn't it? Like it was, and it became a bit of tabloid bait and a bit of bait for um, some of the far right groups like Britain First. But actually there was that, like you said, imagining what life would be like in the Islamic State because then Siddhartha Dar famously turned up in Islamic State territory shortly after that. So there was a, there was a kind of living this fantasy element to it that then became a reality, I think, when ISIS came along, right? That's right. That's another of my arguments in the book are based on the analysis I have of these individual cases. Um, and I have an interview with a former uh, Guantanamo Bay detainee, a Danish Algerian, who I got to know, uh, where I talked to him about uh, how does the ideology influence his life and how does he um, use the ideology to think about his own actions. And um, it was, it's a quite detailed anthropological even psychological portrait of this man, who then actually were one of the first Westerners to die fighting for Jabhat al-Nusra. I think it's really important that, um, that we understand that uh, they respond uh, not to push. It's not the case that these are people who have foreclosed their life opportunities, or uh, I mean, the bounty, being, selling bouncy castles um, might not have provided uh, a good income, but it was really the excitement uh, and the attraction that had pulled people into these networks. Uh, I think it's important to stress that ideology and the reconstruction of the self in the image of the ideology creates a very powerful incentive structure that is based on desire, based on um, projection of um, power um, and uh, masculinity, all of those sort of things that we talk about, but it, it is pull rather than push that really motivates people. Mm. Okay, yeah, let's let's come to that then. So what, based on your database, what are, what are some of those myths and misconceptions? And I think you, you just touched on one of them that actually a lot of these recruits were motivated by an idealistic vision, a utopian vision rather than you know, they were necessarily anger, angry and disillusioned at society. So what, what are some of the, yeah, those myths and misconceptions that maybe your, your book and your database addresses? Well, one of the misconceptions is that they turn around and attack uh, the homeland because they're angry at the homeland. Uh, the first thing they want, and nearly all of them, including the women, is that they want to travel. They want to go abroad. And then at some point in time, depending on what uh, the strategic objectives are, what the current tactics are, uh, then they, they, they may get turned around uh, and told to go home uh, and do something at home, uh, which was sort of the first instinct. But that, that, that's from 1998 on that they came, they were trained, they got instructions, they were sent back. But then more, in more recent years, in recent decades, there's no relationship uh, between people's origin and where they actually carry out their attack. We, we get this completely globalized and integrated network where like, if you look at the people who carried out uh, the November um, uh, uh, campaign in, in Paris, uh, they knew each other both from the streets of Brussels and from, uh, the, from the Islamic State. Um, I, I, I have a picture of a group sitting around in a house that they had taken over in Aleppo. And there they are uh, sitting together in a house in Aleppo, some of the key members of that attack network that was behind uh, the, the Paris attacks. And they knew each other from Brussels, 
um, and 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 uh, are from Aleppo, but elsewhere as well. Um, and uh, they, it was a multinational gang. Uh, many of them were um, uh, uh, French speaking uh, from from and the, the core, but there were and then there were the Klein brothers who were uh, sort of in the medium level managers, and, and it, it was a very multinational, multicultural, uh, integrated ne attack network. Mm. I was going to actually on the on the point of those Paris attacks. Am I right in thinking that um, the head of IS external operations was a Belgian who knew those yes. um, with the leadership of ISIS or AQI as they were then in mm. the first in the in the 2003 after the 2003 invasion he was in prison there for a long time right so this is but, uh, yeah yeah so he's you know this is a guy sending his own friends and relatives back to yeah. conduct attacks back home uh, in in his home country yeah but the concept of back home is a broad one right I mean mm. so um... Um, at one point in time, one of the members of the network actually also went to Birmingham to raise money uh, mm. for the attack. So, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask one last of my own questions, and then I'll try and take some from the audience because I, I realize just looked at the clock and realized time is flying by. Um, so about the so just continuing on the theme of myths and misconceptions. What about this? And it crops up again in what you might call kind of CVE initiatives, but like and 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 in political rhetoric as well, especially around the time of the ISIS um, travelers wave, but this idea that this is like a movement of kind of vulnerable adolescence or, or you know, like you said, angry and disillusioned um, people, what, you know, what do we, what can we learn about, if anything, or what conclusions can we make about uh, integration, about socioeconomic status, about their hopes, dreams and fears in life and that, that sort of thing? Well, so there are a lot of different motivations. I mean, it's um, as, as John Horgan has said, ask not why, because there are multiple reasons for why, ask how. Um, and so the answer to the question of how is, is, you know, networks. But the other point is that what we do, what we are able, we can't put people on the couch and say what um, particularly precipitates this decision. There's evidence, for instance, of some of the young women actually were really motivated for a desire for access to sex. Uh, they lived in households where their circumstances were really quite circumscribed. And they liked the idea of, of, of becoming, you know, going up there and, and uh, becoming a glorious um, uh, participant in the movement and, and uh, finding a mate. Um, th they were obviously disillusioned and they were completely deluded about what they were getting into. Uh, but none of those women, as we look at them, have really been coming, they've been middle class uh, women. They are, they're not really, they're, we have uh, a couple of ex exceptions, but they tend to be converts to Islam and women who have been sort of either prostitutes or in other ways, uh, Emile Kerning is a French example of that. Uh, but uh, we have other, uh, so it, it is difficult uh, to completely generalize, uh, but, um, to be clear, this is not a youth phenomenon. Uh, we, the press had talked so much about the youth and uh, the youth were useful to the Islamic State, but the youth is not useful now to what the movement aims to do. If they teenagers, uh, if the teenagers want to go out and do something on their own, that's all fair and game. I mean, that just falls on the same wagon, but they're not really part of the sort of more strategic integrated uh, tactic for, for warfare. Uh, the average age um, um, is around 26 to 27. Uh, it dipped uh, briefly uh, for when people join up. It, uh, it dipped uh, under the Islamic State uh, to, to uh, 24. Um, and we do see, I have a, an age crime curve in the book somewhere. We do see a pickup of uh, younger people, uh, but it's, you know, 18. And then you have a very sharp curve up. But then you have a very, very long tail of older people uh, who, who join up. And we certainly have examples of people in the 30s joining up. Uh, so uh, that presents a real problem uh, for intervention strategies because I personally, I think that the CVE tactic uh, were, and policies were really based on the idea that we needed to grab on, on, on to institutions so we could find a mechanism of delivery. 
it was much it was much more a search for a mechanism of delivery, namely schools or you know youth. You can still or you still have an institutional context where you can deliver um, uh, content. Um, you can't do that uh, uh, for thirty year olds who live independently, uh, and they're much harder to find. Uh, so I think ultimately we have been really. I, I'm very skeptical about the whole CVE uh, tactic. I've I've kind of I've made that point myself in the past about things initiatives like prevent and things like that and and, and how information you get about referrals might skew understanding of the picture because it's like are we are they interacting with the kind of people that those services are more likely to interact with in general or are they actually interacting with the people who are a, a, you know a risk or a threat you know because as you said the delivery mechanism mechanism is health mental health services schools and things like that so um yeah there's something i've raised in the in the past and i do agree with um so just getting to uh, some of the um, audience questions. So um, I think right at the beginning, you mentioned self-starters. Could you, um, Andrew's asked if you were, would be able to just clarify um, a transition to more self-starters. What, what exactly is meant by self-starters? Is that the same as the lone wolf um, dichotomy, well, not dichotomy, sorry, model, or is that different? Do you mean the same thing? Could you just clarify that for us? Well, I, I avoid using the word uh, lone wolves or lone actors, because even people who act on their own usually have um, a, a community, uh, a small one or a bigger one uh, that supports the idea. So uh, I write about uh, the uh, Boston Marathon bombers um, who really were soft starters. Uh, I looked very hard for any type of uh, support network with their there still are some very open questions that we can't answer about how they actually figured out how to make uh, the bombs uh, that they used at the uh, Boston Marathon, um, these home cookers. Um, so people have said they were built on the description uh, in Inspire Magazine and Inspire Magazine was found in their house. Uh, but uh, the, 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 most of the case, most cases where people have tried to use those um, recipes for how to make a bomb in your mom's kitchen, um, as um, Inspire Magazine put it, have actually ended up blowing uh, their hands off or making uh, dirt uh, devices. Uh, the Boston Marathon bombers did manage, uh, and that question we still don't know about, but we increasingly know uh, that uh, they did actually have a network. They did actually have a, 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 a small group of people uh, around them who played along with the ideas and reinforced their ideas. I mean, now know that Tamalent and I have uh, committed a triple homicide on um, September 11th, 2011, uh, which was an anterior act uh, to the planning of the, then he went, he went abroad and he went to Chechnya trying to see if he could, he could fight abroad. Uh, but he did have, a, uh, uh, he did have help, uh, somebody named Tadasha, who was uh, one of his pals was part of that. They were both uh, drug dealers and the people they killed were drug dealers. Uh, but this act uh, was uh, highly, um, uh, it, it was a very ritualized uh, murder done with a knife and uh, the marijuana money was left on the bodies uh, that had been mutilated. Uh, so this is, uh, this is information that we still don't really have sort of coming out uh, because we're still waiting for the final court case on the younger brother. But I would uh, argue that they were an example of a really unusual self-starter uh, group. So self-starters are people who haven't gone abroad, haven't had training by a pro somewhere else, uh, but have used the tools provided online um, uh, and tested them out and managed to create um, uh, 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 an attack. Uh, so one of the issues we see with some of the more recent um, self-starters is that uh, we have a much higher incident rate of mental health problems among them than we have seen in uh, other types of um, um, attacks and uh, um, many more use in guns. So we have this convergence between uh, the new cohort of self-starters, uh, people who really don't have um, a direct physical contact with anybody else and uh, various other uh, um, incidents of, uh, of uh, uh, mass shootings. But I think there's a big divergence between the US and Europe here because if you take, uh, you know, 
you mentioned uh, the killing of Sam Petit. There was uh, this young man who committed the act uh, was um, prompted by a support group. If you take uh, the um, Bastille Day in um, uh, truck driver in, in, uh, in, in Nice, uh, now we have eight people on trial um, in, uh, in France for helping him, some of whom uh, were uh, radicalized um, and um, provided instruction, uh, best as we can tell, uh, and others uh, who were not. Uh, but we also had that in the Paris attacks. We had some of the people who have been um, convicted in connection with the Paris attack were people who were gang members and provided the weaponry. And they knew each, they knew the perpetrators of the Paris attacks through the gang network and probably didn't know how the, the guns were going to be used. Or maybe they did and didn't care. But I would say that this is a this is what I call, um, so that the, the Boston Marathon bombers are an interesting example of um, a self-started group that actually had an, sort of um, a group of people who were egging them up. Um, most importantly, actually, um, the brother's mother, uh, who was very keen to see um, her sons uh, become heroes of their own story as uh, martyrs. Uh, we underestimate the degree to which people like the Snipe brothers actually truly believed that uh, once they died, uh, they would go straight to heaven. Uh, their soul would separate from their bodies and uh, they would uh, achieve the highest state, uh, status in heaven. They, we, we have some evidence, including I would direct you to Joe Casanayev's suicide statement that he wrote inside the boat where he was eventually found. Um, it's a very eloquent uh, description of this belief system. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, those, that's what I use the term self-starter uh, to designate. Just off the back of that, do you think that that um, martyrdom element is something that kind of the Western liberal secular mind underestimates in all of this oh definitely people just um people don't believe that that they really believe these things it just seems uh such a uh a strain on anybody's imagination uh, but read, read the chapter with um uh, um uh, uh Sliman, uh uh, Hajj Abdurrahman, who um, the Danish Algerian NGO, he totally believed that, completely convinced that God had a plan for him, and that was his plan, and that was going to happen for him. And then there's these additions, and they can, you know, they can bring in their families, and then all other sins are forgiven. Um, uh, you know, such so a what does it matter if you smoke marijuana or you have, in in Shlomo's case, been producing heavy metal music? Because all of those sins, that yes, it is forbidden, but all of those sins are forgiven the minute you commit the ultimate act of sacrifice. Mm. Okay, um, if you don't mind going a couple of minutes over, I can take a couple more questions. Is that okay? Um, okay. Got one from Fiaz about um, about uh, the intergenerational dynamics. So he mentioned about the first generations of Islamist uh, activists and exiles, uh, or the jihadi veterans that settled in Europe. Um, is there any evidence of their children and grandchildren involved in these movements or, and just generally speaking, generational and interfamilial ties? And I think um, there's an incredible example in your book from uh, Molenbeek of uh, one family which provided dozens of recruits or something like that, right? If you could speak a little bit on the interfamilial and intergenerational um, activism. Yeah, we, we do there. have some examples, but they're pretty rare, to be honest. Uh, in most cases, the families are totally aghast at what the young people are doing. And actually the families really don't understand what they are watching. Uh, but this of course um, relates again to the youth issue that we have discussed before, that uh, this, this applies in cases where um, uh, youth are still at home living within the families. Um, but when you look at the sort of older cohorts uh, who convert to extremist Islam, uh, whether or not they have been brought up in, in Islam or they have not been brought up in Islam, generally speaking, overwhelmingly, there's no, there's a generational effect in the sense that there are older recruiters who then train and recruit the others, but they're not familial relationships. But yes, we have examples of um, families, um, you know, um, uh, in London, we have Hamza, uh, Abu Hamza al-Masri, uh, who, whose son uh, went to Yemen on his, uh, to ended up in prison in Yemen as part of a, 
completely crazy plot to kidnap tourists. Um, and so we have examples of um, uh, families, but family split. I mean, even Bin Laden's own family completely split on this. You have his young son Hamza being groomed uh, to uh, become uh, the, the prince. And then you have uh, two other sons who have completely turned their back, even uh, a former wife, and written books about their uh, experience uh, living in Afghanistan with Bin Laden as a father. Uh, and I, I think it's, um, I, can't, I don't have lost count, but I think there are uh, two daughters who were married off within, uh, to, within the movement and, and two sons uh, from uh, Bin Laden's uh, 26 children or so. Um, who ended up joining the movement. So um, generally speaking, I would argue that um, the familiar connection is quite weak, aside from that family that in Merlin that mm. I described, yeah, the Abakans. Okay, cool. Um, I think I'll merge a couple of the, couple of the questions that I've had, um, and then we'll, we'll, maybe we'll finish on this one, and it's the most dangerous one, because uh, it's talking about the future. So we've mentioned that, you know, the... Uh, the West experience of jihadism didn't start with 9-11. I mean, you pretty pretty emphatic that it hasn't ended with uh, the ISIS caliphate episode. Um, I guess some people would say that it has ended, or you know, it's time to move on. You've 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 talked about the next phase, the next stage, um, and you have talked about it a little bit already. But can we maybe just spend a couple of minutes elaborating on that and and maybe the, what form it might take inside of Europe as well? So I think the first uh, uh, worry about more organ, aside from self-starters and people who have mental health problems and pick things, decide to do something because they have read about it online. Uh, I think the most um, uh, dangerous situation we have are networks of people who have um, uh, come back to Europe uh, either uh, on false passports and come in through the refugee streams, uh, but actually have plans. Um, they, we don't, there's a bit of a, a news blackout on some of the arrests. Uh, but an example was um, uh, a, a group of, uh, um, I think five people uh, who were arrested. Uh, it was part of a family, there was a family network. They were all uh, Iraqis some in Denmark, some in Germany, and they were uh, started to build bombs and they were found out because they had um, ordered detonators from Poland online. Uh, so this was a group that had uh, knowledge of each other, trust in each other through family connections and marriage and uh, through knowledge of each other from their past. Uh, their ideological commitments were clear because they knew each other from um, the fighting days in Iraq. And I think this is where the, the most serious danger lies right now um, in, in, in the European context. Um, now, uh, those people uh, that we know of have been really tied in with the Islamic State. We have not seen any um, effort in Europe on the part of Al Qaeda uh, to carry out attacks. But again, uh, we did have uh, the incident uh, with um, a Saudi cadet who had been infiltrated into uh, the um, a trainee program um, for in and came to uh, a naval airbase in Florida as part of the trainee program, and uh, we then later learned the military later learned that he had actually been deputized by Al Qaeda in Iraq to uh, infiltrate the Saudi. Uh, military and get himself uh, located, uh, relocated to the United States, and he carried out an insider attack. So I think uh, I think we have seen uh, elements of Al the Al Qaeda strategy really changing a lot uh, away from the sort of signature of Bin Laden strikes with ma uh, mass casualty attacks. I think but I think uh, Ayman Al Sabah here had reached a conclusion that those types of attacks alienated too many people. Uh, among the groups that he really wanted uh, to, um, among Muslims that he wanted to appeal to, um, and also the strategic logic of these types of insider attacks was far more effective in the case of the um, naval air base of the U.S. immediately suspended the collaboration with Saudi Arabia on this program. It was later reinstated, but these types of policy changes provoked by insider attacks, I think, 
is much more in the, it, it, it is much more of an intelligent uh, attack on strategy uh, that I think uh, I'm an outsider here was beginning to um, to put in place. Now, will uh, Sever here's death uh, change that? Um, we don't know, but we do know that there is um, another cadre ready, another leadership cadre available for Al Qaeda and in place. Uh, so um, I, I, I don't know, but I don't, I, I think the, the changes that we are seeing um, in, in terms of um, risks in uh, Europe and in the United States, um, I'm in some regards, dramatically different from say the Paris attacks, uh, because the, the Paris attacks were, were really sort of bringing the insurgency to your streets, depend on a, a, a type of resource mobilization uh, that um, may not be present right now. So that's why I think you're looking more in infrastructure attacks, you're looking more at um, sort of um, um, insider attacks, infiltration. Um, there was a plot to um, that we don't know much about in the U.S. Uh, to uh, assassinate uh, a Saudi uh, ambassador, and those are the sort of things I think we need to think about. Just, just finally, just on that, um, I mean, you you talked about the lessons of history before, and we've seen we've seen the influence of the returnees from other jihadist conflicts is obvious in your book from Algeria to Afghanistan, Bosnia, other other jihadist theaters around the world. Um, to my mind, there's not just the risk of the ISIS returnee generation. Of, uh, the risk isn't just of attacks; it's it's of them helping to socialize or radicalize, if you like, a whole new a whole new generation or a whole new cohort of recruits. Um, is that fair to say of history as our only guide? Yes, but I think we need to remember that by new. It's a layered phenomenon. It's like things never go away; they stay. But then something new develops underneath, and that means that the challenge here is that. Um, there's so many faces um, of, of the threat that is really difficult to sear in on, um, on where to focus. So one of my uh, things I advocate for in the book is that we think about, we skip the CVE agenda, uh, we focus on uh, more public education about extremism, and then we drill down on enforcing the capabilities of uh, law enforcement in order to identify and um, prevent attacks, but also beef up uh, international collaboration, which is very unpalatable because it means working together with countries that we probably often don't want to work with, like Saudi Arabia. Um, but uh, this is a dilemma that has always bedeviled uh, counterterrorism that in order to be effective, you really have to work uh, with these types of countries that uh, at least publicly you would prefer um, to raid criticize, but you can't criticize, can't, and we saw that with Egypt, you can't criticize Egypt and expect Egypt to work together uh, with you on, on issues. That's what my book, The Cartoons, uh, how the, the Cartoons That Shook the World is all about, how Egypt used the cartoons to get back at the US. Mm. So that's a great point. We, we didn't even get to that in the time that we've had, but I would strongly recommend to go and read both, both uh, the, well, go and go and check out the Western Jihadism Project uh, if you can, and I think you've mentioned that you're going to um, make some of it available to researchers and, and journalists um, where possible. But also read read the book from last year, and also read uh, the cartoons that shook the world as well. And uh, mentioned how prescient that is, um, given given the recent attempts on Salman Rushdie's life as well. So um, that's it. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for the audience. I think most the major majority of people stayed with us, even though we went a few minutes over um and yeah any any final thoughts before we log off no i just want to say thank you and sorry for running over time there's so many so many things to talk about so um i'm grateful to the counter extremism project and to you liam personally for making this possible and thank you for listening in nothing to apologize for it's my fault for going over i, I like to ask too many questions but i will uh i'll send out details for this this will go up on youtube afterwards and um i'll send a link to um li link to your work and to the book as well so um people can buy it and i can't recommend it enough it's a formidable phenomenal book so um definitely go and check it out and um thank you everyone for your engagement your questions um hope that was interesting and enjoyable thank you <laughs>